Ashley, thank you so much for uh, being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, for those who haven't met you at an expo or training, could you share with everyone your name, your company name, and where you guys are located? Uh, well, my name is Ashley Keith. I'm with Whistler Plumbing and Air. We're based out of Rocky Mount, Virginia. Very good. Now, yeah. where is Rocky Mount for people that aren't familiar? Well, if you're familiar with Roanoke, Virginia, um, it's about 30 minutes south of there. So very good. Not too far from a not a bigger city, I guess. So yeah. Western part of the state, though, away from the coast. Yeah, yep. away there from the go. coast. Yeah. Very good, very good. We're talking for a great reason. We're talking about a topic that we really don't talk about enough on this show, and I don't think it's mentioned a lot when we're talking about plumbing, and that's water purification, and specifically how we educate homeowners about the quality of their water and, and how to you know educate them on, on products that can really help them. Uh, kind of share with everyone what, uh, what your role is at Whistler these days. So I've been here for five years now. I started out as a field technician um, coming in. I had a couple years of prior knowledge. I was working with municipal water, doing the chlorination for a private water company. Um, then I came here and started as a technician and was in the field for four and a half years. I was doing uh, maintenance on these systems um, as well as repairing and and then got into sales in my last year or two really more so uh, more than half the time I would say I was doing sales calls. Um, and then now this February, I am now the department manager for our water treatment department, which is five people total doing full-time water treatment sales service. Uh, we also offer maintenance contracts. So we have a person that does those full-time as well. So what, what is that department? You know what that you guys are projected to do in terms of revenue uh, by the end of the year? Uh, so we have a, uh, a goal and this month is actually, um, we're doing pretty well. This is one of our best months we've had this year. Um, Great. we do about 1.7 million in water treatment a year for the department. Wow. That's yeah. a lot. That's great. I know you, uh, before we hit record, you were sharing that your, your last full year last year in the field, you did over 600,000 alone in sales and service. Yeah. Closer to 700, but that was, yep. Sales and service wise. Yep. That's fantastic. That's great. So you guys definitely have the formula down. So uh, you, you kind of ex explained it. You were in, you, you came from a water background. What did you do before then? Were you in school? I mean, you're, you're a young person. So how did you um, eventually swerve into it? Absolutely. Um, so my father actually runs a water and wastewater plant for a municipality. So wow. he's been doing that for uh, um, 20 years. So when I was in elementary school and middle school, when I would get out of school, I didn't go home. I went there and I sat in the office and watched what he did just so he could, yeah. uh, so I didn't want to go home. So I watched him test water. Um, of course, wastewater is a little bit more a different field, but I yeah. quickly realized that I didn't want to be in an office position, even though I eventually ended up here, but I'm not <laughs> in the office full time. I try to get out right. as much as I can now. Sure. Um, sure. But I quickly realized that I didn't want to have a computer only job sitting in an office. So I saw that as an opportunity to get out and get in front of people, work with my hands, which eventually led me to really love what I did was problem solving and figuring out, you know, how we can make things work when it may not be an obvious answer. So yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. I started out watching him do that. And then I actually worked at, at a lawyer's office for a little while, and then that solidified my question that I didn't want to sit in an office all day. So That's a pretty extreme difference right there, attorney's it, office versus what you were coming from. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and, um, and then actually after that, I did sales for a furniture company, and, then I, oh, and I was really good at that. And I was like, well, yeah, it's hustling. You know, I'm trying to figure out how I can get not in an office position, position, but do sales, be in front of people. So that's when yeah. I found this job. So it kind of melded the two together. So very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah. let's, let's talk about, um, the business and, and, and kind of a process of, of getting calls, managing calls, selling homeowners on the systems. First of all, like how many leads are you guys getting purely on, uh, like marketed versus, you know, it's a service opportunity that turns into a new system, you know, off the top of your head. 
Uh, so our goal for the month is 45 leads for our okay. either technicians or salesperson to run at a $4,500 average ticket for install, which okay. blow that out of the water most of the time. Um, $4,500 sure. is a little low for our average ticket. Might have to adjust that goal for next year. Um, yeah. But uh, as opposed to what we get from, because we do not only water treatment here, we're plumbing, HVAC, sure. um, and we're going to start getting into electrical as well. Um, yeah. Typically, we get 20 of those leads from tech-generated leads, and then 20 okay. are just calls in, or we offer free water tests, so calls for that a couple different ways. But we normally hit around that 45 to 50 leads a month number. So Yeah, I mean, you guys are a big player in that market. Is it mostly with those free water tests? Is that just through TV and radio type stuff, or where are you promoting that? Billboards and radio. Mainly. Okay. We just actually started doing TV commercials four months ago, but those have been more generated for HVAC considering it's the summertime. So. Yeah. That time. That's, yeah. right. That's right. That's great. Great. Well, very cool. Uh, well, let's talk about, so uh, in terms of training, you're, you're, I'm assuming, are you managing the training now for your team and how to manage the, the call process? Yeah. So um, we actually just hired a new technician, but he came in with some experience. So I could really get into the training on the more difficult, you know, scenarios and then also get into more sales training in itself. Yep. So all that's all that's done. But basically, as far as paperwork, um, how our procedures go here, that's handled in our training department. More specialized training would become coming from me. So. OK, very good. What's how how often are your texts and training then weekly to kind of both on the tech side and communication side? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we do sales training once every two weeks where it's about an hour and a half. We sit down and it's only for sales training. And yeah. then um, normally once a week, I like to get out with them in the field and do more. If it's not technical, more of how to read personalities and how to write options catered to personality types or, you know, in more detailed, less detailed, things like that. And then also... Yeah. I also manage a couple, like I was telling you, uh, inspection MSI technicians that are only doing plumbing inspections. So getting out with them, making sure that um, water quality is tested in every house they go into and is a discussion how to bring it up, when to bring it up, things like that. So That's awesome. So you're doing ride-alongs every single week. Yeah. I make it. Cool. Well, everyone here is a manager. We're required to do two at least a week. But that's easily hit when... You know, you have eight to 10 people in the field and you want to be, you know, in front of them. And like I said, I don't like to be glued to this chair. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it, do you, how do you decide on who to ride with? Is, is someone struggling a little bit or you just have a regular kind of check in and go, okay, it's Joe this week, Mary next week. How, how do you decide? Uh, I would say, uh, like I said, I have that new technician. Um, he's been doing really well, um, but I want to make sure that I'm in front of him constantly to make sure that you know he has prior experience but i want to make sure that it's catered to the way that we do things here because it may be Absolutely. you know it has been different in a lot of aspects um okay. but typically i do just shuffle right through the list like top to bottom that way i'm hitting everybody on a pretty regular basis so very cool very cool well let's talk about uh let's let's dig into the call process it all starts with a phone call coming in yeah. how do you your ccrs or csrs uh, at whistler kind of set your techs up for success? I mean, are they mentioning that we're, hey, we're definitely going to be testing your water, you know, just on basic plumbing service calls? Or how, what do they do to make sure you're as prepared and, or your team is as prepared as possible? Right. Well, if a call comes in strictly for a plumbing issue or say if they just want their MSI inspection done and their Diamond Club members, um, that's something that's put up front is we'll do a thorough evaluation of your home, including a water test, water pressure readings, um, and then they kind of mention what they'll check while they're there. That way they have a heads up. So it really sets the technician up for success when they come to the door and, you yeah. know, they go over what they're going to do. And they're like, oh, yeah, I already, you know, they discuss what you're going to do, um, um, pretty much have at it. And then they come back to them with the results and go over that stuff so if it comes in as a normal water treatment estimate call we're asking up front um, is there any existing equipment are you on well water municipal water all that good stuff so we can go ahead and have some idea of what kind of area it's in what the water quality looks like and gives the 
um, the salesperson a, a better uh, jump start on what to say and what they're going to be walking into. Support for this podcast comes from Redesign.co. Are you finding it hard to make your mark in the competitive digital world? Look no further than Redesign.co. Our expert services will ensure your business achieves maximum visibility through programmatic display, device ID geofencing, email marketing, and a strong online presence. Don't let potential customers slip away and allow your brand to blend in with the rest. Get in touch with Redesign.co and let our exceptional digital marketing team help you stay ahead of the competition. Obviously, you you did it for 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 a long time, and now you have uh, you're training your team on how to walk walk into a home and connect with a homeowner, right? Especially if you're getting mm-hmm. called on a on a true sales opportunity, you know you've got to try and differentiate yourself, and and so mm-hmm. that that Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner don't call doesn't call someone else. So what exactly. what, what what do you what do you teach to to try and connect with a homeowner? Right? Certain things. Um, that you- I think the biggest um, difference that I try to explain in detail is our warranties and guarantees. And like I mentioned earlier already about our maintenance agreements. So yeah. uh, that's something that definitely sets us apart um, with every system we sell. If you sign up for a maintenance agreement, we offer a lifetime warranty on the equipment, no matter how okay. long you have the equipment. And it is transferable yeah. to a new homeowner. So really that you know, if the homeowner knows that their system was seven to $10,000 to install, and it's going to be four or $500 a year to maintain, they're not going to spend a penny more than that a year. Even if we have to take out the old system and put in a new one, all of that's covered. So, and that's something that I haven't found that any other company or at least around our area offers. So peace of mind is something that definitely sets us apart as far as estimate calls. So do you bring it up real early? You're like just after you get in, you kind of, you know, so you kind of let them know right well, away. This up early. Um, but one thing that I've tried to implement, especially with the new guy, is when we're writing up these estimates, go ahead and include the first year maintenance in that first option. Don't even break it apart into a second option. Go ahead and lump in and say, You know, this option one is X amount of dollars and includes your first year, what we call our water treatment agreement. After that, you will have the option to continue it. And then your lifetime warranty will continue and your maintenance will be included. That way, the customer gets a good idea. They see the first year maintenance. They see what we're doing, checking out, testing the water, bringing in the salt, all that good stuff. And after they see what the maintenance is like, they see that they're getting a quality from us and we're having it checked and maintained. I mean, we hardly have anyone canceled from the water treatment agreement past that point, but not really selling it as an add-on up front, um, going ahead and lumping it in with the install. It's It's been really, really good. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I mean, you, once they see that service, it, you kind of differentiate yourself. like Right. Uh, on yeah. those those sales uh, opportunities, you know, let's say someone doesn't have a system right now. You know, maybe they're new to the area, don't even know. They just know they need a softener. What uh, what what are some questions do you, uh, that you train your your techs your salespeople to ask to kind of get the homeowners start thinking about what they need or how the water affects them you know because a lot of people don't know right well I always start out with um, are you seeing water spots on faucets how often are you know when's the last time you replace your water heater um, how are your dishes coming out clean? Are they spotty? What's going on with that? Um, do you have glass shower doors that are just destroyed from hard water? How's your skin? I mean, sometimes you have to tread lightly with personalities and what you ask and things like that. But some <laughs> sure. people they'll come out with, you know, my skin and my hair are super dry ever since I moved into this house. Well, they may have come from a well where their water wasn't hard. And then now they know something's wrong but they're not tying all these things into it. They're just seeing sure. this, but let me talk about the other things that it's also affecting. So I'm um, right. just kind of leading up with those questions. If they say like, I know my water's hard, I need a water softener. Why do you think it's hard? What have you noticed? You know, kind of ask those open-ended questions. So it's not just, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. I need softener. Like get into okay. the discussion. So that way they see the, the cost and the benefits so, and right. the benefits definitely outweigh the cost in the long term. So you just yeah. have to hold their hand and walk them to that conclusion themselves. So, right. Yeah. You got to start getting to think about all the ways of water, 
that hard water is affecting every part of their lives, right? Right. Because you're, yeah. you're right. A lot of people don't think about it. They just turn the faucet on. I got water, right? You know, and if it came from a well, they're used to it being a certain way. And if they're not, they don't think that they're not on a well anymore. I would assume a lot. I mean, I think that's most people don't think think about their yeah. water too much. Yeah, that's, and I would say a majority really don't know where it comes from. And that's not, you know, that's not an everyday, you don't think about that. Like you said, sure. if you turn it on and it's water, great. I don't really have to worry about it. Well, you don't worry about it until you're replacing a water heater every two years or, you know, your faucets are spraying yeah. out every which way because you have grit in the aerator and you can't figure out what's going on. Then you think about it, so... Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and that stuff adds up. Those are expensive repairs. Mm -hmm, Forget about just how you feel physically. Holy cow. Yep. Um, all right, so you, so you go through this opening conversation. Is the, I assume the next step is to go test uh, test the water? Yep, so we check and make sure that we have no pre-filtration, um, that we're getting straight from the main water line, whether that be on a well or a municipality. Um, and then we test and we... Test pressure as well, because that's very right. crucial into um, plumbing failures, uh, water quality, pressure are the main two things. So we do that and then we present, uh, we'll even do a soap demonstration on soap sudding. Um, we'll do oh, it with okay. their raw water. So we'll fill a beaker, put in drops of just pure soap into a beaker, and then we'll fill a, another beaker with treated softened water. So we'll sometimes bring even softened water into their home, shake that, and you'll see a huge difference with soap scum, water becoming clear, cloudy. Just giving examples as, you know, they may not think it's that bad, but in the in the midst of washing clothes, doing dishes, all that, it kind of gives a visual on how it yeah. could be versus what it is. And if you have someone that's, their laundry's not coming as clean or their dishes are coming out foggy, right there, you know, your, your soap and your scum are not separating. They're staying together. So that's what's staying into those clothes and those dishes and visuals for the right personality go a long way. So. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, what other, so what kind of water test do you guys use? Is there a certain type mm -hmm. you prefer? Uh, like a brand of the test kit yeah. itself. Okay. Yes. Um, we've been using Hawk. It's H A C H. Um, while we have really good, consistent results with that. The test kit even comes with uh, a softener that will attach to the end of a kitchen sink. So you can run their water through the softener and then have the product water coming out, soft water, which you can fill that beaker with that I was talking about with the soap demonstration, but all that comes into one kit itself. And then yeah. you have, of course, your other tests, your hardness, your iron, pH, um, yeah. nitrates, copper, all that stuff in there. Right. So, so once you get the readings on all these, these different, uh, levels, right. I mean, I'm, I'm average Joe guy. How do you explain to somebody what all that means? Like, oh, this is really high. Well, what does that mean? So how do mm -hmm. I, I, you know, what are some ways that you communicate with people that aren't in this industry? What that, you know, why that's good or bad. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of the, the tough part is putting into words that people, you know, will understand and not just saying this is high. You need to put in a softener walking them <laughs> right. through. Um, sure. So I would say anything above, you know, I say your readings eight grains per gallon. So in reference, um, if you were to take a, a gallon of water and boil it on the stove, um, it would lead trace amounts of calcium and depending on how hard your water is after water dissolves or as it sits in the water heater, that calcium kind of comes out of the water and that's what settles in the bottom of the water heater. Also, when the water evaporates, that's what you're seeing on your faucets is left behind calcium, magnesium. Um, for every few gallons of water, a uh, baby aspirin of calcium is going somewhere. Um, if your hardness is around eight grains to 10 grains per gallon. So whether that's going in your water heater, on your faucets, in your, on your skin, things like that, it's, it's yeah. going somewhere. So kind of explaining what hardness is, because some people know what hard, they've heard hard water, but they're not aware that it's actually a mineral that's dissolved into right. the water. So, um, and when water evaporates or sits, it, comes out of the water and has to settle somewhere, whether it's lining the pipes, things like that. So, yeah, 
Yeah. Now I know you you brought with you some uh, some learning sheets or something that you show uh, yeah. homeowners. Maybe explain when to share that with everyone watching and people listening. <laughs> Maybe describe what what you have and and at what point do you to use those those sheets to educate people? So when I was talking about our inspection techs that go out just for plumbing, we're doing yeah. inspections on the whole home. We call these our home comfort surveys. So that's where we go through like the water heater, toilets, tubs, showers, sinks, and the kitchen. But at the very top of this form is our water quality portion. So okay. even our technicians, our plumbing techs have basically many versions of our bigger test kits that everyone in the water treatment department has. So every technician has a test kit and is, and is expected to test water every home they go into, whether it's an wow. inspection, whether it's a repair, whether it's an estimate. Um, it's very crucial to know because tankless water heaters, um, the warranty's voided at a certain amount of hardness. Um, so basically every tech is expected to test water on every call we go to here. So, and, and, uh, I saw real quick, there's about five or six boxes and they're either green or red, which I love right. the visual, right? And it, because yeah. if something's marked in red, all of a sudden as a homeowner, you're like, oh boy, that's, that's yeah. Serious. Why is this which, in the I, red? Whoa. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah. which very well done. I'm not surprised you guys are top notch. So kind of explain what those boxes are, uh, briefly, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So we have pass and fail the green and red. Okay. Um, so yeah. Chlorine, um, they put their measurement that they had for chlorine because that's just as, can be as detrimental as hard water. So they yeah. do pass or fail for that. And then they measure in hardness, pass or fail for that. pH levels, pass or fail. And then iron levels, pass or fail. And there's parameters on here. So, you know, standard for chlorine, 0.3 parts per million. If it's over that, it's a fail. If it's under that, it's a green. So, yeah. It's a visual for the homeowner, like you said, when you slide that across the table, nobody wants to see anything in their home that's failing. So, sure. But kind of this whole sheet that we go over is their whole house in this form. Yeah. And every category, the TMP on the water heater, the elements that were tested, the drain valve on the heater, all that gets a pass or fail. So it's kind of yeah. just lumped in to their whole home inspection that we do on those inspections. Right. So. It, it's a great way to, to, I was just thinking as you're saying that, to, to educate people on water, like you with the TMP, all those things are like, oh, water affects, I mean, it yeah. seems like a, you know, common sense for us that are in it, but for a homeowner to go, I didn't think that water quality could degrade a water heater, degrade valves, right? right? And all mm -hmm. of a sudden I called you in for a new toilet and I'm going, oh boy, this is a real concern, right? So, right. Especially when you like you have a flapper that's eaten up with chlorine, for instance, and that's a fail yep. on this form, then the technician yep. can go, well, this is exactly why we test your water. And I wanted to let you know that we did test your chlorine, which leads to things like this. And this is what your chlorine level was, giving them an exact number. So it's not like we're just guessing that it's high because their flappers deteriorated. So really yep. putting a number to it and showing them that we take the extra time to not only solve the problem at hand that day, but kind of prevent it from happening again. So, right, right. Do you guys have a certain KPI you're hoping to hit on X amount of inspections? We expect out of 10, we're going to sell, you know, two or three are going to be in, you know, softener systems or you're, sh you're shaking your head yes. So I'll, I'll let you talk. Uh, well, as far as our inspections for our plumbers or yeah. our. So that, that would be more of, um, I have a few that can quote these systems. But we really focused on them setting leads for our salesperson or right. our our lead technician. I have a few that are really they are they're go getters. They like them. Yep. Uh, they like their uh, commission checks that they get. So they're <laughs> always they're always like, "Can I quote this? Can I quote this?" And I'm sure yeah. city water's you know easy to quote. You know, it's always probably going to be hard water chlorine. I'm like, but if you're on a well, you better set a lead because we don't really we don't want to put in anything that. You know, we stand behind what we put in. We offer a 156-day test drive. So if oh. they put in a softener and they don't like it within 156 days, even if it's on the 155th day, if they don't like it for any reason, we don't even really ask any questions, we'll take it out and we'll give them every penny that they spent back. Yeah. So that's why we have to stand behind what we do. We want somebody to be happy with what they have and make sure they get the right system sized correctly is another reason for that. So, 
But yeah, I have a few of them that are really go getters that they want to lump it in with their repipe quote, which is great. You know, they want to yeah. lump it in with all these things. So, sure. and I'm all there for it if we do it the right way. So, Absolutely. yeah. So you're re really measuring a few of them that sell, but mostly it's it's the flip leads you're trying to keep an eye. It's on. the flip leads. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. So on those those well waters, you said a little more difficult. You know, how do you do you know? I mean, routinely what the water is going to test at, or does it really vary wildly in your community? Uh, we live in an area, uh, we service an hour and a half of Rocky Mount. So if you go to wow. like the radius going east to west, you're going to get completely different results. So it, it's, sure. you can't, even if uh, they're neighbors, you know, their wells are 40 feet apart, um, you never know. It can, you have to do... Well water is a whole different animal than municipal water. And yeah. you have to worry about flow rates um, for these units to backwash, where city water, you're probably always going to have enough pressure. In that case, in city water, too much pressure. But on well water, you have to make sure you have enough pressure to backwash these systems. So it's just a little bit more in depth than um, than city water. But no, well water is... Uh, that's that's where I that's where I like to work because it's the more in depth problems, not the just hardness and chlorine you're dealing with. So yeah, it, it's yeah. a little bit more in depth there. Sure, you mentioned a water pressure. This is the second time you mentioned it. I wrote it down because again, before I got into this, I had no idea that water pressure came in at different speeds and how that affects your plumbing system. So how do you educate homeowners about what what water the, the water pressure varies and this is how bad it can be for you. So what, what do you, what do you routinely say in those situations? So if we're putting a gauge on a house that's on a municipality and we're there in the middle of the day, say it's 80 to 90 PSI, that's going to immediately throw a red flag because in the, you know, in the middle of the night when no one's using water, um, the pressure is going to probably be over a hundred, 110 PSI. And our softener systems are not rated for over a hundred PSI. You will literally right. blow apart the tank in some instances because they're, um, they're fiberglass tanks and they can only handle so much pressure. So especially if a house is downhill from the, um, the, the storage tank, the water, the water storage tank in the municipality, if it's getting, I mean, it, you can get 120, 130 PSI. Um, it's just putting stress on all the gaskets in the house, all the faucets in the house, all the shutoff yeah. valve and our systems. We can't put those in and warranty our systems because it has to be under, the 100 psi mark so that's yeah. why it's tested on every house so it makes it a very clear uh, upgrade when building options it's like we can't put in absolutely system. here's your quote for your softener and your pressure regulating valve <laughs> yeah yeah so. and then, yeah and then it makes it real easy the explanation okay well it makes sense i have to have it right because i don't want absolutely. this new thing i'm spending thousands and thousands of dollars upon to, to blow up you know within a couple right. of years Yep. Um, all right. So you, uh, so you do your water test is the next step, uh, then like on sales calls to, to build, build out options right there, or is there something in between that you like to do? Uh, after we're kind of explaining what's going on with the water, we have to go and make sure that number one, we have access to a receptacle, a drain and the main water line. Um, if somebody has a whole completely finished basement and their main water line is coming in, through the wall in their living room, you have to have that conversation of we're going to have to cut drywall or, you know, and we'll patch it back. But, you know, you kind of have to lead them through what the install is going to look like. So it kind of gives them an idea on how much work is going to have to go into it. Um, it's sure. not, some people just think these are, um, they don't know what a softener is. So going through the brochures with them, letting them know the width, the height, how much room this is going to take up, what it needs to yeah. be installed, having them a part of the process. Um, like I said, some people have never even seen a water softener before, so they don't really understand, you know, you're giving them a quote for a couple of thousand dollars and they're going to look at you and they don't really even know what they're getting for that. So you have to kind of right. walk them through what it looks like, um, how long it's going to last, where it has to go, make sure that you're getting everything in the home treated, that none of the lines are teeing off before it goes to where you're going to be installing the softener. That's kind of a in between based on the personality, if you walk them through that or you do that on your own. And then while you're yeah. in, you know, the basement looking at those things, that's when I would write up those options at that point. Cause you gotta, you gotta see how much work is going to go into each install. So. Sure. Sure. I like that you, you really educate them on because 
The last thing you want is for the install team to show up and they're cutting into someone's walls. They go, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, but I'm sure that happens a lot in the industry that people go, well, this yeah. is what we got to do. I didn't realize. You yeah. I didn't know this was going in. I didn't know that all this was going to have to happen. Well, <laughs> right. right. We don't want any miscommunication. So. Sure. sure. All right. Well, when you, uh, when you build your options, how many options do you typically like to build? How are they generally differentiated from, you know, one to however many you, you Typically, we like to stay around the three mark. Um, city water is, um, you don't really have as many options as you can well water. Well water, there's a couple different ways to solve every problem. City water, you're probably just going to have what we put in, we call a city softener. And I know that some people don't sell the brand that we sell, but it handles hardness and chlorine in one tank. And that's perfect solution for every home that's on municipal water. Um, and then our second option, we kind of, our first option would include the city softener and then reverse osmosis water, which is getting into right. another treatment. And then yeah. the second option would just be the city softener or the municipal softener. So, but we always lump in our reverse osmosis in with our city water system. Sure. So how do you, how do you educate people on what reverse osmosis is? Uh, well, that's a conversation when you walk into the home, you see four cases of water bottles sitting beside the refrigerator, or you see a big Berkey filter sitting by side their sink or a Brita pitcher, things like that. Um, yeah. how many, how many cases of water are you going through a week? What if yeah. I could put that same quality water at your sink at a tap, you know, yeah. that you could use to wash your vegetables, uh, fill your pasta pots, drink out of, I can even hook it to your refrigerator. So your ice is reverse osmosis water, which I always said, and a lot of people like this, um, Starbucks and Dunkin', that's the water they use for their coffee. Um, and then I'll take a bottle of their water out of their case, flip it to the back and nine times out of 10, they say purified by reverse, by reverse osmosis. So I say, you can have this water, not in plastic and not have to plug it from the grocery store. So it's just yeah. a open-ended questions. Um, do you guys drink the water here? How does it taste? Things like that. And then getting into, it's going to take everything out of the water. We're really going to get the dissolved solids as close to pure water as we can because pure water has zero dissolved solids. And that's also a test we do in our water test. So that's when I would lump that back into gotcha. what you had now versus what RO would bring it to. So, yeah. So you can see right away, I bet like if people are nodding and, or if they go, yeah, I don't care. You know, you can tell right away if that's going to be something that, that you really. Uh, yeah. And, and if they're not interested, it. if they're not interested, um, we're going to put it on there anyways, because yeah. some people may, you know, act like that. But then after you leave, they may start researching on Google. I don't remember what she said about reverse osmosis. Let me Google what this water is. And then they really get intrigued onto, you know, that's the best quality water you can have in a home is reverse osmosis. Yeah. So we're always going to put that on there. Um, like I said, we're building options before we're presenting. So we're building those options. It's already on there. We're going to go over it and we're not necessarily sell it as an add on, but sell it as a complete system because you have your point of entry filtration. Then you have your point of use that's you're going to be consuming. So we sell it as, you know, the softeners for everything that, goes on the outside of your body and touches everything and the RO is for what you're going to be consuming. Support for this podcast comes from Pulsam and Customer Lobby. Successful certain path members like you know the value of thinking like a customer. We've got the tools to help you do just that. Enter Pulsam Plus. Combining the power of Pulsam and Customer Lobby to enhance your customer's journey by creating value at every touch point. We've helped hundreds of certain PATH members like you win and retain more business. Pulse M Plus utilizes Pulse M's industry leading reputation management capabilities to help you build out the early stages in your customer's journey and maximize your online reputation through Google reviews. Then, Pulse M Plus keeps your customers coming back by incorporating Customer Lobby's powerful retention platform using postcards emails, and text messages to send the right message at the right time to encourage repeat business. And as a certain PATH member, we'll waive your setup fees. For more information, please visit get.pulsem.me. Obviously, these systems, they start, they start adding up. 
you know, the economy has been a little interesting. So have you, do you guys uh, present these in, in, with the finance price or, or do you just yeah. show the, the overall price? Our option forms, they have um, investment, they have an investment box. Yeah. So that's where we put our normal price. And then we have the financing box, which is where we put our five year, seven year, 12 year, 15 year plans. Um, okay. We put the prices break down for that on every option. Even if they say we want to pay with cash, even before you write the options, we're still going to put the financing option on that sheet. So yeah, I love it. Yep. Got to do that. Got to do, do you guys yeah. finance a lot or is it just a small percentage? Uh, we, we finance about half, I would say half Ooh, of the systems. Good. Yeah. That we put in. Company, right. So got to build into the price, but, uh, if you do that, it's a great tool to have for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, got to ask you about objections, right? That's the fun part of sales. Sales, at least people that love to watch and listen to these, these videos. Yeah. So how do you, uh, how do you handle somebody that goes, Oh my God, I had no idea. I thought this was going to be a couple hundred dollars or something. Right. Or, or is that expectation brought up earlier in the call? Like, you know, Hey, you know, this is going to be mm. roughly this or that. How, how do you handle that? Uh, well, I mean, like I said, some of these people have never even seen a water softener before. So they, right. they have no idea a price range eight times out of 10. And then you have those right. that are, have Googled or went to Lowe's and saw their water softeners and saw that, you know, it's quite a bit of price difference. And I, you know, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, but the units that are at Lowe's or even that you can get on Amazon, you know, what kind of warranties are going to come with those? If this breaks, who's going to work on it? Because we can't get the parts for it. So walking them through, you know, it is a cheaper on the initial install, but we're talking, you know, how long are you going to be in this house? Are you going to be here for the rest of your life? Are you going to be here for in the next year? Um, looking yeah. at the investment, the cost of ownership of those softeners compared to, you know, what we have. Um, and then walking through, we even break down sometimes, um, cost of soaps, cost of electricity, cost of all this. And then we tally it up in a yearly amount. And almost every time it's, you're saving money by having a softener, even with a monthly payment with financing. So yeah. making them realize what they'll be saving on and it, it truly pays for itself. Um, but walking through the warranties and guarantees to separate you from those wildly cheap systems. I mean, sometimes I even call them disposable units. Oh, work great. For a couple. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I'm just not a I fan. Like you can't really get the parts for them. And they're, yeah. they're extremely hard to work on. And we don't even offer service on those units um, yeah. that you can get at Lowe's, Home Depot, anything like that. They work great for a year or two. Um, and then they're kind of in the same boat as what I've come to realize. You'll have those that'll work for five or 10 years and the homeowner, they just want to buy a new one every five or 10 years, but you're always going to have that, but you need to explain why your system is better. It's a, right. you know, it's really built to last. I mean, we have softeners. We've been doing water treatment since 1980, since 1990, um, yeah. 95. And we have some systems that are 20 years old and literally wow. do not need anything and they're working great still. So when I can say things like that, and I've seen that myself, so I can really, you know, say it with confidence, this is something that's going to last you 15 years, you know, is normally what I say. Yeah. When you break it down yeah. to the yearly cost, it's not that, it's not that much. So hundred percent. And like we were saying earlier with the reverse osmosis, you, you can probably start doing some tallying on water, you know, water purchases as well. I know it, it can, it can add up real fast, especially with like Fiji water and all that stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it's better quality water than Fiji water. So how do you uh, talk to people, you know, with water softeners that, you know, either they maybe looked online before you're coming out, but oh, don't you have that slippery feeling right after the shower or something like, how do you address that, that issue or that thought? I call it silky. We like the word silky. silky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, and that's a question that came up when I did the panel. Um, yeah. I think at the end of the day, what I, what I tell people for that problem is we're going to put in your softener um, if you decide to do it. I completely understand that you may have had softened water before. You didn't like that feeling or maybe you showered somewhere that had a softener and then you came home and you said you didn't really like that silky, slimy feeling. Um, I always tell them to try it. I said, we have a 156-day test drive and that's really where it comes into play. 
Um, we're going to do what we have to do to make you enjoy your water at the end of the day, because you're, you live here. I don't, it, you know, I love my softener at home, but you may not like yours here, but there's ways that we can adjust that to make you more comfortable with your water. So and whether that be bleeding in a little bit of hardness, so it's not completely soft water. Um, there's just, there's ways to combat that besides just not having a softener at all. So you get a lot of, uh, boy, Ash, I think I just want to get another bid. Do you get a lot of those people that they use that as a way to get out or not so much? Uh, I would say 20% of the time somebody sees it okay. and they're like, I, I want to check around and see what the, because once again, the, they have no idea. I mean, when you slide that across, they don't know what to expect. They just know that it's expensive, which everything yeah. is nowadays. So you kind of have to. How do you, yeah. How well, I was going to say, how do you handle those situations where, because you don't want to try and, yeah. And just say, absolutely, you know, I would, I would even get a second opinion, um, but just make sure you're comparing apples to apples on what you're getting here. Uh, is it treating everything that we're offering to treat? Are they offering the same warranties and guarantees we offer above and beyond what the manufacturer, you know, kind of provides with the system if you don't like it in 90 days is the other company going to take it back and give you all your money back or are you going to be stuck with something that you spent thousands of dollars on that you don't enjoy do they offer financing things like that you know really setting yourself apart on how they're going to pay for it because obviously if price is the objection it's um it's more times of how can I how can I make this work? How can I pay for it? It's not that they don't want it. It's that they're trying to figure out how they can pay for it. So setting setting up the financing, you know, if this monthly payment's too much, I can make it into this monthly payment, um, which you can pay off at any time going over that. But at the end of the day, if someone wants a second opinion, I mean, you can't fault them for that. They're kind of, they're looking at for themselves and that's what being a good homeowner is. You know, they're wanting to better their home by getting a water softener, but they want to get the best deal and they want to make sure that they're getting the quality. So going over the quality of what they're getting, the installation quality, how we're going to protect their home when we come out there, floor protection, laying down mats, all this kind of stuff, um, the warranties with the install. That's what I go over with that. I guess I'm assuming you kind of, hand oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, another point to that, I would even bring this up first. Um, the company that you might go with, make sure that they can service it because a lot of companies, they can put them in, um, but when it comes to service, they won't give a call back or they just don't offer that. So yep. are you going to be calling us uh, to service your equipment? And is it even a brand that we can service if they don't service it? So that's a big thing with something like that that really does need servicing. You know, you don't. <laughs> there's nothing more frustrating than trying to call someone and not. And not yeah, and not getting a call back or you know getting the run around yeah. with that. So. Right. If mm -hmm. uh, in the situations you go, you know, you handle it beautifully, right? I, I respect you, you wanting this to call around. How how frequently will you call back uh, that person? Do you set an expectation? I'm going to call you in a day or two. How do you how do you handle that situation? Um, how do you train your people? I, th I think that, you know, not discussing a specific day to have a call um, is setting yourself up for failure. I would say, you know, if they give a reason, like I want to get another quote, well, about how long or do you already have an appointment? Um, I'll call you back and see how that went and see if there's anything I can do for you and say next Wednesday afternoon, I'm going to be calling you back just to give a follow up. Set it with, you know, no pressure. Um, I'm just going to call and see how that went. See if you have any other questions. See how, if I can differ differentiate myself more so from that company. Just to have a conversation with you next Wednesday. But setting an exact day to do that. Um, so number one, they know you're going to call. So it doesn't seem like you're bothering them when you call. Um, but yeah. But typically we do that once a week. At the end of the week, okay. I'll print out the quotes or the estimates that we've given in that week. And then we sit down and we go over what day we said we were going to call. And then we make a, a schedule for that time. So we have time set aside to call those. So Okay. When do those leads go back to, say, the call center or the management team to, to you know, a lot of the companies still, you know, the call takers at some point call out when things get a little slower, right? So. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain point where they get two calls or they get a month and if they don't close it, then it goes back or how do you, what's your point? Goes back as in? Well, sometimes it's just one of those, those cold, 
fold leads that still exist, but maybe we won't get to it for, say, when we have a traditional shoulder season, say, and mm -hmm. slow, but call takers will call back out. Hey, we offered you this quote three months ago. We haven't heard from you. You know, can we come back mm -hmm. out or can we present you again? That kind of situation. I print, so I can, like I said, I pull reports on those. So if it's something that we've called back and we only got a voicemail, um, that's something that we'll call back, continue to call back into the next week when we make those calls. So it's not like we call one time and then we just drop it. We continue to go back and at least till we can talk to somebody and either get a no or a yes. We're not calling only, you know, to get those yeses, but I want to know that they have closure, they're taken care of and yeah. If they're not going to buy from us, at least get that no and have that communication. So honestly, we continue to try. It's not something where they get three months out. I mean, typically in the next, in the two week period after their estimate, we're getting some kind of answer, and we okay. we have pretty good success with um, yeah. calling back. Yeah, I was going to say I didn't know if there's a threshold after we call four times, the person's just avoiding <laughs> us. I mean, that's kind of how a lot of people are now. They just hit reject on the. On well, the they phone. might. We keep calling to the voicemail's full. So <laughs> I like the ambition. I like the ambition. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Typically uh, right, so people, one, they call us back. So that's great. Okay. So uh, uh, let's think positively. You guys sell the job. Is there anything you do to try and solidify what happened that day to avoid that cancellation that, you know, buyer's remorse that could set in by the next mm -hmm. day? Cause you, I mean, I don't know how fast do you put these systems in? Typically? I guess I should start with that. Uh, so right now, if you were to buy a softener, we are, we would be two weeks out right now. We do exactly. one in, we do one install a day, um, but normally on that we're like I said we're pretty busy right now. Normally on the average, we're about two days out or three days out on an install. Yeah. So we like to keep it that way. And be like, well, I'm not uh, upset about being busy, but uh, like I said, we're about two weeks right now, which like your to your point gives that extra time for that you know, thinking about it or forgetting the benefits or playing those questions. Do I really need it in my mind? Yeah. Um, if someone does have that situation, we, we always call them back and try to answer the questions of, you know, what, what happened or is there anything else that I can do for you to, you know, get you to close, you know, to get you to go ahead with this. Um, but we all, we always take a 10% deposit. So sometimes that, that'll, you know, they have a little skin in the game at that point. So they don't feel yeah. like they can just cancel, you know, for no reason. Um, they have skin in the game and that's discussed up front. So. Um, once, once the software's installed, you know, first osmosis, do you guys, how do you kind of, do you do any kind of a water test again, or how, how does the homeowner know that, you know, this is actually working? Is it? You put it in. Is it working? Is it working good? Yeah. Um, our installer, <laughs> our installer has a test kit, and after every install, that water is tested, and they're given another report of their product water. So as soon as we leave, um, even washing your hands, you'll be able to tell if it's working or not. And we normally get them to do that, and we always say, um, you know, your service is going to be once a year. But if your water ever doesn't feel like this. We need to come out and see what's going on. But every every install we do, water's tested directly after. Is there any other kind of quality control system you have in place, or is it just you know do you have a man? Do you follow behind to check that the, the techs did what they need to do, or are you you pretty comfortable well, with the team you have? I go on ride-alongs, and that includes installers. So that's um, checking quality. And then also if they do the water treatment agreement, um, that's two visits a year where we're maintaining. So in six months, we're going to be out there again. So it's like I said, I'm, I'm riding with them, checking installs. Also after installs, they're to take pictures of the install work that's done and upload it Very to good. the customer's file. So yeah. all that's handled and documented. And I want pictures of valves that are, that were closed, that were open when you left. I want pictures of everything. Um, so everything's yeah. documented. So that's great. That's great. And I guess, you know, with, with your water quality salespeople, I mean, that's obviously they're, they're offering those systems, but say you're, your inspection technician, you just set an expectation. Hey, this stuff has to be done in every call. It's part of your culture. It sounds like it really, you know, you don't it, it definitely is. Or not yeah. And like I said, even even the normal plumbing technicians, water quality is something that is discussed from day one or day two. That this is not just something else that we're just trying to throw into the 
throw into the pile. This is something that benefits the homeowner tremendously. And if we're going to be a service company, then we need to be giving them the best service that we possibly can. And that includes preventative maintenance and to fix what we're called for that day. So that's very much so ingrained in everybody here. And Absolutely. I constantly do uh, water quality training with the technicians and lead setting training and how to say certain things that they might not be comfortable with. I am very much so technician facing, um, especially yeah. the plumbing techs, as well as the HVAC techs. I have trainings with the, them once a month just to answer any questions or objections that they've been getting in the field, things like that. That's We, we have a very high focus on that. So. You'll train the HVAC technicians on water quality to bring that up or just in general and, you know, communications and sales training you handle that? I'm trying to get them all a test kit right now, actually. Really? Um, because when we're talking about humidifiers, water quality on oh, those, yeah. um, I yeah. mean, they're not excluded from water quality or say sure. if they're in the basement working on an HVAC system and there's a pinhole leak right above their head coming from a copper pipe. Uh, well, let me test your water while I'm here because this is very indicative of having, you know, acidic water. So yeah. that, not that they're going to do it on every call, like say a plumbing tech would, but they have the opportunity to provide them with all the information. Like I said, we want to provide the best service that we can. So absolutely. The company benefits the, you know, the homeowner clearly benefits. I also want to bring up the technicians, salespeople better. You mentioned commission for salespeople, but but clearly, um, they also have uh, spiffs, right? Technicians get spiffed. On right. Certain... That question, what's in it for me? <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah. So we, we do offer, um, if they set a lead for an estimate for a water treatment salesperson to go out, we offer money for a lead set. And then we also offer additional if it closes. So yeah. we have some people that make quite a bit off setting leads here. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And next month, right. I'm going to try, um, we're, we do lead generation contests. So I'm going to try to get um, a, t a flat screen TV approved for whoever sets the most leads next month. So keeping yeah. it fun. Come on, and James, it's a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah. I didn't tell him about that yet. So maybe this will push it through. Maybe voicing it will. Um, but keeping it fun for them. And it also yeah. keeps their focus on, I'm not only here to have tunnel vision to fix what I'm here to fix today, but I need to keep my, you know, take my blinders off and look at this. This can't be, you know, it could be a $15,000 call, not just $800 repair. You know, that revenue that we could be bringing in for just, yeah. and it's not only, like I said, it's, it's for the customer as well. Right. But, and if you're going out there every six months for re repairing pinhole leaks, yeah. that's, I mean, they're going to be, they could have paid for the treatment system by that point of the calls that they're just paying you for. So it's really, it's really a service to the customer. Oh, I agree. So, yeah. Yeah. When you consider all the things, I mean, your, the water touches, obviously everything in your plumbing system, all that stuff is expensive. And if you're replacing no, it, it is. Yeah. So not only is the cost, the time, you know, to me, more and more people value time and having a plumber come out to replace it, that's aggravating. So right. for sure, I'd rather have one visit a year to, to, to service the system versus, you know, something breaks when you have people over and now you got to try and Right. And out, it always so. breaks on Christmas Eve or when you have that's 24 true. people at your house or, yeah, it's never Absolutely. at a convenient time because really when is a convenient time to fix something? Never. <laughs> so Totally agree. All right, yeah. Ashley, last question for you. I really appreciate all your time. This was really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, just any final advice you'd have for for companies or technicians on how to to really do a great job and selling, you know, these water quality systems to, to homeowners and really having success in that type of a division yeah. in the company. Um, a piece of advice I would give would be to not look at it as um, – you know, an add on or just really view it as a service like I've been talking about to the customer and a way to grow your business at the same time. Um, you're already going to be there, say, putting in a new pressure tank or putting in a, you know, a pressure regulating valve. You know, 
lump it into what you're doing because it's only going to yeah. benefit you and the customer too. It's really exciting to get into this. And it's, especially if you're only doing plumbing right now, like if you were just a company only focused on plumbing, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to be had in water treatment. And sure. if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out to me, I'd be more than happy to, to answer those. I had some come from the panel anyways. So yeah. I'm really, uh, it excites me. Um, probably think it's a little bit nerdy, but this is what I, what I've been doing every day for five years. So yeah, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's exciting and it's, and it's ever changing too. You know, there's constantly things that come out about water quality in municipalities, whether it be lead, uh, PFOAs or forever chemicals, um, coming yeah. in the water, water sources. So it's something that it's becoming very much so in the public eye. Whereas before, if you turned your faucet on and water came out, oh, it's good. Where now as people right. are more focused on what's in there, how is it affecting me? So being able to help people with that is awesome too. So, so you're constantly researching to see what's going on and, and what, you know, what new yeah. innovations are being made. Yeah. I mean, it's gotta be, yeah. there's always something, being a, right? Being a member of the WQA, the Water Quality Association, they send out newsletters. It's it, to stay on top of what's happening. And that way, when customers have questions about it, you already know what's going on. You always have to be educated. So if you're not, you never stop learning ever. There's still things that I see that I've never seen before. So, but that's what makes it fun. So. Very cool. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for all your time. Appreciate your patience and figuring out the technological stuff uh, in advance. But yeah. uh, this was really enjoyable. Thank you so very much. Uh, have a great rest of your day. I appreciate it. Thank you. You too. Support for this podcast comes from Bradford White. Bradford White is a full-line manufacturer of residential and commercial water heaters and boilers. While being manufactured and assembled in the USA by American craftspeople, Bradford White's goal is to deliver high-quality, superior products specifically built for the professional contractor. You can always count on the performance and reliability of our built-to-be-the-best products. Visit BradfordWhite.com to learn more. The Successful Contractor Podcast is part of the Certain Path family. Certain Path builds successful home service businesses and has for 23 years. We do it by providing contractors with a proven path to success, professional coaching, software solutions, and a member community of over 1,000 contractors just like you. Doubling your sales with a 20% net profit and an inspiring company culture is all possible. Let us show you the way. With Certain Path, success is made certain. Visit www.mycertainpath.com for more information.